Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, I will continue talking about superposition of the functions, which is basically uh, called the principle of superposition of the um, of the forces, not functions, forces um, in dynamics. Now, this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens, presented on Unizor.com website over there. I do suggest you to watch this lecture from the website rather than from, let's say, YouTube or some other um, uh, source, because um, every lecture has very detailed notes, and also the website has certain educational functionality. Like, for instance, if you are working with a supervisor or a parent, they can actually enroll you into a particular part of the whole course, or the whole course, whatever, and uh, they can take a look at the exams, which you can really take. There are exams in the course. Um, now, also, there is a um, prerequisite to Physics 14. It's called Math 14 uh, on the same site. And there is even another course, which is a civics course, U.S. Law 14. Um, now, the website is free, no advertisement, so I do suggest you to take a look at this. So, now back to the uh, principle of superposition of forces. So, we know that if you have more than one force acting on an object, then we can always replace the result of acting um, of these forces, results of the action, by vector sum of these two forces. Now, obviously, these forces are um, collinear, they are acting in the same direction, then the absolute value of the result will be the sum um, of these two forces. That's the easiest uh, part. In more complicated cases, we can always, as I was saying, mm, replace the action of two forces with one being their um, vector sum. Now, well, from this obviously we can extrapolate to n forces by again combining them together according to the rules of vector algebra. Now, there is one very important consequence from this. Not only we can add two forces together to get their resultant, um, resultant that's the name of the resulting force resultant so not only you can combine these two forces into one you can always if it's convenient for some reason you can always represent one force if there is some one force uh, acting on, on 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 the object as a sum of two or even more uh, forces which, if combined together, give our force. So instead of these two, I can put their sum, or instead of this one, I can put these two forces, and the result will be the same. And under many uh, scenarios in the real life, that's very, very convenient to do this. Now, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to present a couple of examples, which really show how this particular approach of um, representing uh, one force as the combination of two really helps us to, to solve certain problems. All right, so my first problem is related to the movement on the slope. So there is a slope phi, uh, no friction, there is an object. Now, my um, purpose right now is um, how basically uh, to tell how this object moves on, on this slope uh, under whatever the conditions I have and what kind of conditions I have. Well, first of all, there is a force uh, which pulls down this particular object. That's its weight. So the weight goes down. 
let's call it W. Now, is that the only force which acts on this particular object? Well, obviously not, because if that was the only force, it would just drop through the slope down. So there are some other forces which uh, keeps the object on the slope, and obviously this, the object will slide down the slope. Well, we all know that from uh, from the children's playground, for instance, they have a slope. The, um, a child sits on the top, and then it goes down the slope. Why? I mean, obviously, the force which gravitates down to Earth, its weight, obviously, it's play, pl it, it plays the important role. But again, it should be something else. So, what other forces are acting on this object, which result in its moving along the slope? Well, obviously, there is something which we call a reaction force. Now, whenever somebody is or something sits on a slope, we also have the pressure which uh, this particular object um, makes on the, uh, on the surface where it's supposed to, to, to slide down. So there is this direction which is always perpendicular to the surface. And along this direction I have the force which this object acts on this particular uh, surface of the slope. Okay, but this is the force which acts on the slope itself. And slope is fixed on the, on the ground, so it's not moving, obviously. Now, this force is not the force which acts on the object. So, which force is acting on the object? Well, obviously, reaction force. You know the third law, Newton's third law. Whatever the pressure the object exerts on the slope, the slope goes back with the same force. Okay, fine. So, we know this. The problem is we really don't know the value of this force. But now let's think about it this way. We know that the object will move downhill. So this is direction the object will move. Now, we know that there are two forces, this one and this one. The weight and the force which we can call reaction force. Now, the combination of these two forces obviously is the force which goes um, down the slope in this particular direction. So, we know that this force goes vertically down and we know its magnitude and direction. We know this force goes perpendicularly to the slope, and we know its direction. And we also know the direction of the resulting force. This is direction, the resulting force. So, some of this and this should go down this way. Now, how do we actually make the combination of two forces in this particular case? Well, from this point, I have to put the line. We have to build a parallelogram, right? So, how to build the par par parallelogram? If you basically know the side, you know this angle, so you have this direction, and you know the diagonal where the result is supposed to be. Well, obviously, parallel sh parallelogram should be built this way. I um, draw a line parallel to this one, and from this point, I draw a line parallel to this one, right? So, that's my force, WR which is the reaction force, and this is my force, which I can call WF, force which pushes the for uh, push my object forward. That's how I built this, uh, these two forces, this one and this one, in such a way that it makes the parallelogram, because the parallelogram is the way how we add forces together. Now, if this force is shorter, 
I will not be able to build the uh, parallelogram in such a way that the diagonal goes along this direction, right? So if I, for instance, do it from here, if this is where my uh, reaction force ends, and I will build the parallelogram, this would be my direction of the result, right? So that's wrong. Now, this is the only way. Okay, fine. So let me wipe it out, draw a nice picture, nicer picture. I will never be able to draw a nice picture. But anyway, here is the real thing. So this is my slope. This is my object. This is my real force. This is down. This is perpendicular. And this is my, for instance, this is my weight. So this is my forward and this is my reaction so that's the real that's the real picture all right what do we know about this well we know this angle right and which means this is the same angle phi right now this is the right angle and this is the right angle right because this is perpendicular to the surface of the slope so basically i have the right triangle i know diagonal that's the weight of the object it's given how can i find out this force which basically uh, is the resultant force which um, uh, makes the object moving so obviously WF and I'm talking right now not as a vector but as an absolute value it's a magnitude of this vector right so if I don't put this um, overline above it it's considered to be the magnitude of this particular vector and obviously it's written as what W times sine phi now this this is obviously w cosine phi now let's be um, a little bit negligent about frame of reference i did not really mention what exactly the frame of reference is so i'm talking about magnitude and I'm talking about this particular picture and this is basically sufficient to write the uh, equation of the motion because if I know the force then my equation of the motion is m times a equals to where m is the mass of the object a is the uh, acceleration down the slope now this is fixed right weight is fixed and uh, angle phi is fixed so my force is constant which means my acceleration is also constant mass is constant so this is equal to wf equals to w sine phi so this is the most important part well a obviously from this is equal to now um, what's very important is, and I will definitely go through this when I will talk about gravitation, um, the connection between the weight and the mass on the surface of the, er or of the Earth. This ratio, weight divided by mass, is equal to 9.8 meter second square. This is the acceleration of the free fall. So any object will fall with this acceleration because the gravity actually pulls down. Within certain, obviously, uh, precision, because obviously if you go very far away to, to the space, that would not be exactly the same. Even on Earth, if you go to the top of the mountain, the acceleration will be different. This is on the ground, it's some kind of an average. So, and it's called usually G constant g the gravitation constant so this is equals to g times sine phi where g is a known constant okay 
So it depends on the angle phi. Uh, what's interesting is, let's just do some kind of analysis. If the phi is equal to zero, which means slope is actually flat. Well, if the, flow, if the slope is flat, my weight goes down, my reaction force goes up, and there is nothing which moves down the slope. And obviously this gives us, if phi is equal to zero, then this is equal to zero. There is no acceleration along this slope. On the other hand, if my phi is uh, steeper and steeper, if it's 90 degree, then basically this particular uh, object doesn't really press. You see, if the slope is 90 degree, the object on it doesn't really press. Everything goes down. So the whole force of weight and the whole acceleration uh, would, would, would go to um, uh, because sine of 90 degrees is equal to 1, so it will go to complete G. So acceleration will be down as if it's a free falling, because the slope doesn't really um, resist the movement. It's vertical, right? Well, that's it. That's it about this particular problem. And we will continue with the next problem. Now, my next problem is related to the following situation. Um, many of you probably saw it in, in circus or somewhere else. It's some kind of a trick. You have a motorcycle which goes into the loop and then it goes very fast around the loop. So, I would like to examine how this particular thing is, is working depending on the initial speed. Well, considering it's a constant speed, so V is the speed, constant speed, as it goes along the circle. So it's basically a linear speed of the motorcycle as it goes. Now, obviously, if the radius is equal to R, uh, this is equal to R omega, where omega is angular speed how many radians per second it makes, right? The angle. Okay, so this is given, but based on this number, we have to really make all these calculations, but not everywhere. I'm talking only about two points, at the very top and the very bottom. But I'm mostly interested in what kind of a pressure this particular motorcycle exerts on, on the loop at this point and then this point. Now intuitively seems obvious but as it goes down this way it's kind of pressing down and the pressure should be greater. When it goes up the pressure should be smaller. It's like levitating a little bit, right? So let's just examine this using uh, the principle of superposition of forces and our um, our representation of certain forces as a combination of two, uh, of two or more other forces. So, let's talk about, for instance, the top of this. First of all, I would like actually to make a little bit more precise um, definition of the frame of reference. Let's consider that frame of reference is this. So this is the z, this is zero, and this is x. Okay. So we are talking about this particular point. Uh, now y coordinate is this way and it's zero, right? So we're not talking about y point. All right. So what can we say about the object, let's say of mass m and weight w at this particular point? Well, let's examine the forces which are acting. Now, obviously there is a force which is Wait. Okay. By the way, if W is my absolute value of this particular force, the magnitude of this vector, the vector goes down against the Z. So basically the vector is in vector mode. It's with a minus sign. So if I would like to combine whatever forces uh, uh, I have using their absolute, absolute value, I have to put them 
with some kind of a sign. Okay, now what else? Well, obviously, this particular motorcycle uh, is pressing on the loop with some force, right? Now, this force is directed from the object to the loop. And again, let's put it, uh, I don't know, P or whatever, pressure. And again, the loop presses on the um, on the object according to the Newton's third law with the same force, it would be minus P. Uh, the only thing I will put the letter T, which means top, and this would be bottom. All right, so now the reaction force from the loop will also go down, and that would be therefore minus PT. Now, at the same time, we know that whenever my object is moving in a circle with constant angular or linear velocity, there is a, a force which is supposed to keep it on the loop. So these forces are okay. We, we, we know that they are actually acting uh, on this particular object. But the result of this should be the force which keeps the object in a circular trajectory. And we have already examined this, that the force which is supposed to be uh, uh, keeping its mv squared divided by r, b is a, um, the linear speed, or m uh, r omega square, where omega is angular speed. So we know from our um, examination of the circular motion with constant angular and linear velocities, we know these formulas. It's, by the way, very easy to derive. And there is a previous lecture which, which does it. All right, so this particular force is supposed to keep our object on its orbit, on its trajectory, and it's directed towards the center. So this is how it is. This is how it's supposed to be. So they must be equal, right? And I will also put it with a uh, minus sign, because again, the force is down opposite to Z line. OK, this is basically sufficient for us to find out what is the value of uh, the pressure at the top. Well, first of all, I can always multiply by minus 1 everything. From here, I will see this. minus w, right? Or, considering, uh, I was just talking about before, that weight and mass are related by um, multiplier g, which is gravi uh, gravity constant, uh, on the surface of the Earth. So that would be mass r omega square minus g, or m uh, v square over r minus g, because v is r times omega, right? So v square would be r square omega square. Okay, would be the same thing. So this is my result. This is the pressure which my uh, which which the motorcycle exerts on this uh, loop, and the loop exerts on the uh, motorcycle. Now, here we can actually talk about a very interesting um, situation. If v squared divided by r, where v is linear speed, or r, r is the radius, is equal to g, my pressure is zero. If my pressure is zero, it means the motorcyclist actually feels like being basically weightless at this particular moment. So, at some very specific speed, um, it will be weightless at the top. If it will be greater speed, 
the whole thing would just press upward. So the the motorcycle motorcyclist will feel that his direction of his weight is up. Well, but since he's basically sitting upside down when when he's on the top of the loop, that kind of corresponds to 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 normal to normality for him, right? Um, however, again, if it's equal, v square over r is equal to g, then he will feel weightless. And what happens if v square divided by r is smaller than g? Well, there is no pressure over there. It's negative pressure, which means what? Which means he will fall down. He will not make the loop. That's what's important. So whenever you are making a loop, you know the r, you know the g, doesn't really matter what your mass is, but your speed should be sufficient to make this thing positive. Otherwise, you will fall down from the top. You will not make it. Okay, now let's talk about bottom. So, at the bottom, again, I have W down, which means it's supposed to be with a minus sign. Now, my pressure from the motorcycle to the loop is down, but from the loop reaction is back, uh, is upwards, right? So in this case, my pressure at the bottom is positive. And so is my uh, centripetal force, which basically keeps my object, my motorcycle, on this particular trajectory. So that's also a plus. From which we can see this bottom would be this and plus would be this and plus would be this. Now in this case there is no danger. He will not fall down anywhere. He will definitely go through this point and obviously the pressure is greater now than the weight. The weight is m times g, right? So the pressure will be greater, which means that as as he feels, as the motorcycle cyclist feels at the bottom, he will feel that the whole thing actually presses him down with the force greater than usual weight. So it will be overweight. So this is underweight, this is overweight. And there is absolutely no chance to get any kind of weightlessness. Weight only increases. And again, you probably felt it yourself if you are in a car and you are actually going in this particular direction. Whenever you're going down, you feel a little bit, everything goes down, which means everything is heavier, so to speak, right? So this is why. All right, so these are a couple of problems which basically gives you a, a feel how we can use certain techniques in um, adding or uh, subtracting the forces, the superposition of forces, to solve uh, real problems. Um, I do suggest you to read the documentation for this lecture, the notes, it's on the website. Um, and, uh, well, basically that's it. I think I will spend some time um, solving certain problems uh, and that would kind of reemphasize this principle of superposition of forces. All right, that's it. Thank you very much and good luck.